There was seething in the comments on my previous video where I made the case that small ported speakers aren't that accurate for studio use. I don't care about troll comments, I care about facts. And here are some facts. This is a study measuring various different kinds of distortion in popular pro audio monitors. You can see from the waterfall plot that this speaker here exhibits excellent time domain performance across the entire range of the speaker. The lower mids and the bass are very fast indeed. Compare that to this speaker, you see significant resonances below 100Hz and there's even ringing at 300Hz. It seems that the resonances are so bad at 50Hz, the ringing might last for half a second or even longer to decay to 60dB, which is hilariously bad. So which is which? The one that looks good on the chart is a classic Yamaha NS10, absolute legendary speaker used in many studios as a near field for mixing. It is a sealed cabinet, so it doesn't have very good low bass extension, and it's more of a mid-range frequency focused sound. However, because it's a sealed cabinet and it hasn't got any ports, the time domain properties are very good indeed. The other speaker is a Tanai Reveal. This was a classic for bedroom producers because it was cheap and had a bunch of bass. So if you're making tunes, electronic music, you can really hear that bass but it comes at the cost of accuracy. It uses ports to hype up the bass to make its small cabinet sound bigger than it actually is, and that really induces resonances because that's what ports do, and it comes at the cost of the time domain properties, which are just obviously less good in the ported Tanai Reveal compared to the Yamaha NS10. But let's not stop there. Let's look at some other speakers. So another pair of speakers here. So what speakers are these? A are the classic Auratones, loved by many professional mix engineers and amateurs turn their noses up at them and say they don't sound very good, there's no bass there, why would I buy those? They sound horrible when they don't understand them. And B is a classic budget studio monitor because they're pretty good, but you can still see really bad time domain performance below 100 hertz. But let's not stop there. Here is another small ported speaker and another small ported speaker and another small ported speaker. And as you can see, they all have the same pattern. If they're small with a port in order to enhance the bass so they can produce more bass than their size would naturally permit from a sealed design, well, they can get that base, but it comes at the cost of time domain performance and accuracy. Have you ever wondered why so many pro mix engineers are very happy to give up that deep low bass, the full range sound and the sparkling higher top end just to have a really brutal mid range sound? Well, the answer is because the secret is in the mid range. If you want to get a solid mix, you must nail the mid range. All of the super low sub frequency stuff and all of the top end shimmery high frequency fairy dust stuff is relatively unimportant for the mix. A mastering engineer can just sort that out in two minutes. The important bit is to nail the mid frequencies because if you don't get the mid right, your mix isn't gonna translate, it's not gonna sit well at all on other systems. The mix is just gonna fall apart when you play it on other systems. So that's why pro mix engineers are very happy indeed with NS10 or Oratones because they have fantastic time domain and harmonic distortion properties in the mid frequencies. If you've got full range monitors that go all the way down to 30 or 40 hertz and all the way up to 20k and it looks pretty flat on the frequency response chart, you might actually get terrible mixes mixing on those monitors. When you combine the inaccuracies of a small ported speaker that is otherwise full range with the inaccuracies that you get in a non-perfect, especially small room, then that's a recipe for getting absolutely horrible mixes that don't translate at all. You'd be much better off with a pair of headphones. Well, let's imagine you've got a full range response, you're hearing a lot of bass, and you want to mix the bass guitar and the kick drum. Well, if you've got a really oomphy sounding kick drum coming through in the room, then you might be like, yeah, that, the kick drum's coming through, it's sounding really nice. But you're just hearing the low frequencies that maybe some people, when they're listening to other systems, they might not even hear that bass because it's going to be, uh, it's not going to reproduce on their particular speaker. So you're relying on the oomph of the sub frequencies, low frequencies that are not even existent on some other speakers. 
and you're forgetting the mid-range. So you're not nailing the mid-range and you're relying on the sub-frequencies. That's a big problem. And the same with the bass guitar. Let's say you're in an inaccurate room and you're hearing you've got peaks and troughs in your bass response and then certain notes of the bass guitar might stick out more than others. And now you're going to EQ that down and EQ certain other notes up. And then you listen to it on another pair of speakers and you might have the opposite going on. And it's just going to all sound like a complete mess. So it's a disaster. It's much better just to not hear that bass at all, roll that off and focus on the mid frequencies and let a mastering engineer sort out what's happening in the sub frequencies. This is why if I had a bad sounding room, I would much rather have a 400 euro pair of Auratone speakers with no bass than a 10,000 euro pair of Genelec speakers, which are full range. So this seems to back up the age old rule of thumb, small room, small speakers, big room, big speakers. Although this is a pretty simple rule, which might actually be helpful by accident, is actually wrong. A better rule might be something like this. A crappy sounding room, small speakers, a good sounding room, big speakers. So let's break this down. Why am I saying that? Well, let's think about it. If you've got a crappy sounding small room, what are the problems you're going to be facing? You're going to be facing a really inaccurate low end. You're going to have peaks and troughs in your frequency response, in your low end, and you're also going to have flutter echoes and weird echoey stuff going on in your room. But let's say you've got a crappy sounding large room. What are the problems going to be there? We are going to have an uneven low frequency response. You're going to have peaks and troughs in your low frequency response, and you're also going to have problems with echo. So in both cases, if you've got a crappy room, no matter how big it is, you're facing similar kinds of problems. So a few people use this small room, small speakers, big room, big speakers thing to say that the speakers that I built and I showed in my previous video were not suitable for small rooms. Now, that may or may not be the case, but it's not for that reason. And by the way, if you're interested in building a pair of mastering grade speakers for under 2K, just like the ones I built and I showed in my previous video, or my course telling you exactly how to build those speakers is now live. You can just go to my website if you're interested in that course and check it out there. But anyway, some people were saying that my speakers won't work well in a small room because small room, small speakers, big room, big speakers. And those are big speakers, so they don't work well in a small room. Or well, let's go over this more in detail and see why this is misguided. So let's revisit our two big problems for crappy sounding rooms. The first one is an uneven low frequency response. So what can we do against having an uneven low frequency response if we've got a crappy sounding room. Well, one thing we can do is just hear less low frequency information so we're less distracted by it and we're less influenced by it in what we're doing when we're shaping the mix. That's the approach that we get with NS10s and Oratones and why so many professional engineers have gravitated towards them over the years and they've stood the test of time because in Whatever room you're in, they're not very room dependent because all of those room modes that are really influencing the translation of the mix, you're just hearing less of it. What better way to be less distracted by it by just hearing less of it? Well, naturally, the sealed enclosures with a low Q factor, you're just going to hear less of those problematic low frequencies because they just roll off higher. Now, let's think about it. Let's get now a small pair of ported speakers that hype up the bass and give you more bass and they're really full range and they're hyping up all of this bass in the low frequencies. What you're going to get, you're going to get distracted by all of this bass and it's going to be really exaggerated in the low end and that's really going to be compounded by the inaccuracies of the room. So now you've got two things that are inaccurate. You've got the speakers that are inaccurate and now you've got the room which is inaccurate compounding that inaccuracy and now you've just got a whole big soup of low end mess. The second problem is reverberation, echoes, flutter echoes, interfering in the directness of how we're hearing the signal. We're hearing all of this diffuse ambient sound rather than just hearing the direct mix, how it should really sound in its more pure form. So how do we deal with that problem and how do we hear it closer, more accurate and exclude the room? Well, we can just bring the speakers closer towards us and the closer they are, the more direct signal we're getting proportional to the ambient signal 
in the room. So we can exclude more of the room the closer the speakers are to us. And the extreme of that is if the speakers are on our ears, now we're wearing headphones and we're not hearing the room at all. We're just hearing the direct signal 100%. So hopefully that sounds quite intuitive and that explains the rationale behind near field monitors and how if you have a crappy sounding room, you want your speakers to be smaller and nearer so that you don't have the problems in the low end and with the room ambience and the logical extension of that is just to wear headphones and that's what i would recommend for really bad sounding rooms just get a pair of headphones now that should make sense and be a better rule than just small room small speakers big room big speakers because it's not about big room, big speakers, because you can have a crappy sounding big room and big speakers just won't sound good in that room. And small speakers will sound better in that room. So it's really about crappy sounding room, small sealed cabinet speakers or headphones, good sounding room, big speakers with a low resonant frequency. But okay, here's the curveball. What happens if you have a small room, which sounds great because it's acoustically treated, then can you put massive speakers in your tiny room? Or will it sound better with small speakers after all? So maybe the small speakers, small room thing holds up. Well, actually, I'll just go as far as saying that small rooms are almost impossible to get sounding good because it's really hard to acoustically treat a room when it's small. The smaller the room is, the harder it is to treat. Now, a lot of people find this unintuitive because most people just don't know that much about acoustics and they think putting that triangular foam stuff on their wall is going to treat the room and that it should improve their room. No, putting the triangular foam stuff in your room just makes it sound worse. It just generally does nothing to the bass frequencies at all. Nothing below, let's say, 500 hertz. It just lets that continue completely untreated. So you have a boomy, horrible sounding low end and it sucks all of the life out of the top end. So you just get a horrible sounding room with that stuff. What you wanna do is the absolute opposite. You wanna use low frequency absorption bass traps, and then you wanna use diffusion to scatter your high frequencies so you don't kill the top end of the room, but you absorb the troublesome frequencies in the low end. And you get to the point where the smaller the room is, the thicker the rock wall treatment needs to be, and then the smaller the room will be internally because you've got all this treatment on the wall, and it just is it, one of these sort of like tipping points that below a certain size of the room, below a certain footprint, you just can't really treat it. It's just impossible, and it's just doomed to sound terrible. But let's just say for argument's sake, you've got a small room, it sounds good, and you've got these massive speakers. Is it gonna sound good? We can't have them too close anyway, like near field speakers, because they're, if they're up in your face, with a big speaker, you've got like three, four, even five way design. So you've got like a bunch of drivers there. My speakers, for example, got four drivers, the tweeter, two mids, and the bass. And that is spread uh, across about a meter with the transmission line atop the size of these cabinets are one meter and if you've got them up in your face then there's not enough room there for the sound to propagate and combine in the way that it was intended so they can't be up in your face like near fields you've got to have a bit more distance so one and a half two meters distance that means that you have to sit on the back wall of the studio if it's a small room. And if you're going to sit in the back wall of the studio, then you're going to be sitting in an anti-node and you're going to have way too much bass and it's just going to sound boomy and weird. But let's just say for argument's sake, you doesn't sound boomy and weird because you've got this amazing anechoic chamber type small room setup thing going on and you've got no standing waves. Well, sure, sit on the back wall. It will sound just, it will sound just fine. So you can have big speakers, massive speakers in a small room and it will sound just fine. The problem is it's just not feasible in almost any small room because small rooms just inherently don't sound that good. But some people might say, okay, you're talking about theoretically this and that. Well, in terms of practicality, it still applies. Small room, small speakers, big room, big speakers. Well, still, no, not necessarily. One of the reasons that I still disagree with this is because there's no such thing as a near field speaker. There are loudspeakers, but there are no near field loudspeakers. Near field means the place that you decide to put that particular loudspeaker. Now, certain loudspeakers might sound better as near fields in their use, and certain loudspeakers might sound better as mid fields in their use, but there's no such thing as a near field speaker. 
because you can take something which is classically called a near field such as an NS10 and use it in a midfield orientation and it sounds just great. Now that's not near field, that's midfield, despite the fact that everyone thinks that NS10s are near field monitors. Well, the idea of near field is just completely misinterpreted by most people. Near field is the position, it's not the type of speaker. There's no such thing as a near field design. There's only speakers that can be used as near fields better than speakers that are maybe larger and cannot be used as near fields so effectively because they've got too many drivers spread out on too large a baffle. So absolutely, 100%, you can have small speakers in a big room and it sound absolutely fantastic, or theoretically, big speakers in a small room and it still could sound fantastic if it was somehow bizarrely well treated for a small room. But most people aren't going to be able to treat their small rooms very well. So that's the problem of a small room. But yeah, the determining factor of what speaker that you should choose is not of the variable of room size. It's the variable of room quality, how good the room sounds. This is why if you have a bad sounding room, regardless of how big it is, you should probably get a pair of smaller sealed speakers. And the smaller the room, the smaller the speakers and nearer they should be to the point where you want to wear your speakers on your head. And that's a pair of headphones. If you want decent sounding full range speakers, you absolutely must have a decent sounding room. So if you go out and spend thousands of euros on full range, high end pro audio monitors, or whatever monitors you buy, if you don't have a decent sounding room, you're just wasting your money. And that's the difference between an amateur and a pro. A pro goes out of his way to get a decent studio space, rent somewhere on an industrial estate, or finds a room big enough and appropriate to treat acoustically and put a nice pair of speakers in so you can work properly. Whereas an amateur just goes out and buys whatever speakers they like and puts them in their bedroom, on the, the table, or on some stands, like close behind the desk, up against the wall, and hopes for the best, and it doesn't sound great at all. But if you do have expensive, small, ported pro audio monitors in a non-perfect room, try a small test. Listen to the song Feral by Radiohead on your speakers. Listen to it and concentrate on the kick drum and the low end. And then get a pair of decent headphones and listen to the track again, concentrating on the low end and the kick drum and see if there are any differences in the low end. See if the length of the kick is the same. I bet for many people listening, the kick will sound longer listening on their speakers than it does on the headphones. Speaking of headphones, in my next video, I'm going to discuss loads and loads of headphones and why most of them on the market are absolutely crap, but there are a few which are very, very good indeed, and I'll give my recommendations for those in the next video, so stay tuned.